Hello, weary traveler. Come, sit down. I welcome your companionship. Let us continue with the merry adventures of Robin Hood. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, here we go. Robin Hood and Will Scarlet. Thus they traveled along the merry road, three stout fellows such as you could hardly match anywhere else in all of merry England. Many stopped to gaze after them as they strode along, so broad were their shoulders and so sturdy their gait. Quoth Robin Hood to Little John, Why didst thou go not straight to Ancaster yesterday as I told thee? Thou hadst not gotten thyself into such a coil as hadst thou done as I ordered. I feared the rain that threatened, said Little John in a sullen tone, for he was vexed at being so chafed by Robin with what had happened to him. The rain, cried Robin, stopping of a sudden in the middle of the road and looking at Little John in wonder. Why, you great oaf, not a drop of rain has fallen these three days. Neither has any threatened, nor hath there been a sign of foul weather in earth or sky or water. Nevertheless, growled Little John, the holy saint Swithin holdeth the waters of the heavens in his pewter pot, and he could have poured them out had he chosen even from a clear sky. And wouldst thou have had me wet to the skin? At this Robin Hood burst into a roar of laughter. O oh, little John, said he, what butter wits hast thou in that head of thine? Who could hold anger against one such as thou art? So saying, they all stepped out once more, with the right foot foremost, as the saying is. After they had travelled some distance, the day began warm and the road dusty, Robin Hood waxed thirsty. So, there being a fountain of water as cold as ice just behind the hedgerow, they crossed the stile that came to where the wattle bubbled up beneath a mossy stone. Here, kneeling and making cups of the palms of their hands, they drank their fill, and then, the spot being cool and shady, they stretched their limbs and rested them for a space. In front of them, over the hedge, the dusty road stretched away across the plain. Behind them, the meadowlands and the bright green fields of tender young corn lay broadly in the sun, and overhead spread the shade of the cool, rustling leaves of the beechen tree. Pleasantly to their nostrils came the tender fragrance of the purple violets and wild thyme that grew within the dewy moisture of the edge of the little fountain, and pleasantly came the soft gurgle of the water. All was so pleasant and so full of the gentle joy of the bright Maytime that for a long time no one of the three cared to speak, but each lay on his back, gazing up through the trembling leaves of the trees to the bright sky overhead. At last Robin, whose thoughts were not quite so busy will-gathering as the others, and who had been gazing around him now and then, broke the silence. Hey day, quoth he, yon is a gaily feathered bird, I take my vow. The others looked and saw a young man walking slowly down the highway. Gay was he indeed, as Robin Hood had said, and a fine figure he cut, for his doublet was of scarlet silk and his stockings also. A handsome sword hung by his side, and the embossed lantern scabbard being picked out with fine threads of gold. His cap was of scarlet velvet, and a broad feather hung down behind the back of one ear. His hair was long and yellow, and curled upon his shoulders, and in his right hand he bore an early rose, which he smelled at daintily now and then. By my life, quoth Robin Hood, laughing, saw ye e'er such a pretty mincing fellow. Truly his clothes have overmuch prettiness for my taste, quoth Arthur Bland, but nevertheless his shoulders are as broad and his loins are narrow, and seest thou, good master, how that his arms hang from his body. They dangle not down like spindles, but hang stiff and bellend at the elbow. Take my vow, there be no bread and milk limbs in those fine clothes, but stiff joints and tough thews. Methinks thou art art right, friend Arthur said Little John, I do verily think that yon is no such rose-leaf and whipped cream gallant as he would have one take him to be. Pa! quoth Robin Hood, the sight of such a fellow doth put a nasty taste into my mouth. Look how he doth hold that fair fl flower between its thumb and finger as he would say, Good rose, I like thee not so ill, but I can bear thy order for a little while. I take it ye are both wrong, and verily believe that there were a furious mouse to run across his path, he would cry, La or alack a day, and fall straight away into a swoon. I wonder who he may be. 
Some great baron's son, I do not doubt, answered Little John, with good and true men's money lining his purse. A Mary, that is true, I take no doubt, quoth Robin. What a pity that such men as he that have no thought but to go abroad in gay clothes should have good fellows, whose shoes they are not fit to tie, dancing at their bidding. By St. Dunstan, St. Alfred, St. Withold, and all the good men in the Saxon calendar, it doth make me mad to see such gay lordlings from o'er the sea go stepping on the necks of good Saxons who owned this land before ever their great grandsires chewed round of brawn. By the bright bow of heaven, I will have their ill-gotten gains from them, even though I hang for it as high as ere a forest tree in Sherwood. Why, how now, master, quoth little John, what heat is this? Thou dost set thy pot a-boiling, and mayhap no bacon to cook. Methinks yon fellow's hair is over light for Norman locks. He may be a good man and true for aught thou knowest. Nay, said Robin, my head against a leathern farthing, he is what I say. So lie ye both here, I say, till I show you how I drub this fellow. So saying, Robin Hood stepped forth from the shade of the beech tree, across the stile, and stood in the middle of the road, with his hands on his hips in the stranger's path. Meanwhile, the stranger, who had been walking so slowly that all this talk was held before he came opposite the place where they were, neither quickened his pace nor seemed to see that such a man as Robin Hood was in the world. So Robin stood in the middle of the road, waiting, while the other walked slowly forward, smelling his rose, looking this way and that, and everywhere except at Robin. Hold! cried Robin, when at last the other had come close to him. Hold! Stand where thou art! Wherefore should I follow, good fellow? said the stranger in a soft and gentle voice. And wherefore should I stand where I am? Nevertheless, as thou dost desire that I should stay, I will abide for a short time that I may hear what thou mayest have to say to me. Then, quoth Robin, as thou dost so fairly do as I tell thee, and dost give me such soft speech, I will also treat thee with all due courtesy. I would have thee know, fair friend, that I am, as it were, a votary and sh the shrine of St. Wilfrid, who, thou mayst know, took willy-nilly all the gold from the heathen, and melted it up into candlesticks. Wherefore, upon such good as come hereabouts, I leave a certain toll, which I use for a better purpose, I hope, than to make candlesticks withal. Therefore, sweet Chuck, I would have thee deliver to me thy purse, and that I may look into it and judge to the best of my poor powers whether thou hast more wealth about thee than our lie allows. For, as the good gaffer Swathold saith, he who is fat from overliving must needs lose blood. All this time the youth had been sniffing at the rose that he held betwixt his thumb and finger. Nay, said he with a gentle smile, when Robin Hood had done, I do love to hear thee talk, thou pretty fellow, and if haply thou art not yet done, finish, I beseech thee. I have yet some little time to stay. I have said all, quoth Robin, and now if thou wilt give me thy purse, I will let thee go thy way without let or hindrance so soon as I see what it may hold. I will take none from thee if thou hast but little. Alas, it doth grieve me much, said the other, that I cannot do as thou dost wish. I have nothing to give thee. Let me go my way, I pray thee. I have done thee no harm. Nay, thou goest not, quoth Robin, till thou hast shown me thy purse. Good friend, said the other gently, I have business elsewhere. I have given thee much time, and have heard thee patiently. Pray thee, let me depart in peace. I have spoken to thee, friend, said Robin sternly, and I now tell thee again that thou goest not one step forward till thou hast done as I bid thee. So saying, he raised his quarterstaff above his head in a threatening way. Alas, said the stranger sadly, it doth grieve me that this thing must be. I fear much that I must slay thee, thou poor fellow. So saying, he drew his sword. Put by thy weapon, quoth Robin. I would take no vantage of thee. Thy sword cannot stand against an oaken staff such as mine. I could snap it like a barley straw. Yonder is a good oaken thicket by the roadside. Take thee a cudgel, set thence, and defend thyself fairly if thou hast a taste for a sound drubbing. First the stranger measured Robin with his eye, and then he measured the oaken staff. Thou art right, good fellow, he said presently. Truly my sword is no match for that cudgel of thine. Bide thee a while till I get me a staff. 
So saying, he drew aside the rose that he had been upholding all this time, thrust his sword back into his scabbard, and, with a more hasty step than he had yet used, stepped into the roadside, where grew a little clump of round oaks Robin had spoken of. Choosing among them, he presently found a sapling to his liking. He did not cut it, but, rolling up his sleeves a little way, he laid hold of it, placed his heel against the ground, and, with one mighty pull, plucked the young tree up by the roots, out from the very earth. Then he came back, trimming away the roots and the tender stems with his sword as quietly as if he had done naught to speak of. Little John and the Tanner had been watching all that passed, but when they saw the stranger drag the sapling up from out the earth, and heard the rending and snapping of its roots, the Tanner pursed his lips together, drawing his breath between them in a long inward whistle. <sighs> By the breath of my body, said Little John, as soon as he could gather his wits from their wonder, saw that, oh, that, Arthur. Mary, I should think that our poor master will stand but an ill chance with yon fellow. By Our Lady he plucked up yon green tree as if it were a barley straw. Whatever Robin Hood thought, he stood his ground, and now he and the stranger in scarlet stood face to face. Well did Robin Hood hold his own that day as a mid-country yeoman. This way and that they fought, and back and forth, Robin's skill against the stranger's strength. The dust of the highway rose up around them like a cloud, so that at times Little John and the Tanner could see nothing, but only hear the rattle of staves against one another. Thrice Robin Hood struck the stranger, once upon the arm and twice upon the ribs, and yet he warded all the other's blows only for one which, had it met its mark, would have laid stout Robin lower in the dust than he had ever gone before. At last the stranger struck Robin's cudgel so fairly in the middle that he could hardly hold his staff in hand. Again he struck, and Robin bent beneath the blow. A third time he struck, and now not only fairly beat down Robin's guard, but gave him such a rap also that he tumbled into the dusty road. Hold, cried Robin Hood, when he saw the stranger rising his staff once more. I yield me. Hold, cried little John, bursting from his cover, with the tanner at his heels. Hold, give over, I say. Nay, answered the stranger quietly, if there be two more of you, and each as stout as this good fellow, I am like to have my hands full. Nevertheless, come on, and I will strive my best to serve you all. Stop, cried Robin Hood. We will fight no more. I take my vow. This is an ill day for thee and me, little John. I do verily believe that my wrist and eck my arm are palsied by the jar of the blow that this stranger has struck me. Then little John turned to Robin Hood. Why, how now, good master, said he. Alas, thou art an ill plight. Mary, thy jerkin is all befouled with the dust of the road. Let me help thee to arise. A plague on thy aid, cried Robin angrily. I can get to my feet without thy help, good fellow. Nay, but let me at least dust thy coat for thee. I fear thy poor bones are mighty sore, quoth little John soberly, but with a sly twinkle in his eyes. Give over, I say, quoth Robin in a fume. My coat has been dusted enough already without the aid of thine. Then, turning to the stranger, he said, What be thy name, thy good fellow? My name is Gamwell, answered the other. Ha! cried Robin. Is that even so? I have a near kin of that name. Whence came a sow, fair friend? From Maxfield Town I come, answered the stranger. There was I born and bred, and thence I come to seek my mother's younger brother, whom men call Robin Hood. So if perchance thou mayst direct me. Ha! Will Gamwell, cried Robin, placing both hands upon the other's shoulders and holding him off at arm's length. Surely it can be none other. I might have known thee by that pretty maiden hair of thine, that dainty finicking matter of gait. Dost thou not know me, lad? Look upon me well. Now by the breath of my body, cried the other, I do believe from my heart that thou art mine uncle Robin. Nay, certainly it is so. And each flung his arms around the other, kissing him upon the cheek. Then once more Robin held his kinsman off at arm's length and scanned him keenly from top to toe. Why, how now, quoth he, what change is here? Verily, some eight or ten years ago, I left thee a stripling lad with great joints and ill-hung limbs, and lo, here thou art, as tight a fellow as e'er I had set mine eyes upon. Now dost thou not remember, lad, how I showed thee the proper way to nip the goose feather betwixt thy fingers and throw out thy bow arm steadily? Thou gayest great promise of being a keen archer, and dost thou not mind how I taught thee to fend and parry with the cudgel? Yea, 
quoth young Gamwell, and I did so look up to thee, and never thought thee so above all other men, that, had I, I make my vow, if I had known how thou wert, I would never have dared to lift a hand against thee this day. I trust I did thee no great harm. No, no, quoth Robin hastily, and looking sideways at little John, thou did not harm me, but I say no more of that, I pray thee. Yet I will say, lad, that I hope I never feel again such a blow as thou didst give me. By our lady, my arm doth tingle yet from fingernail to elbow. Yet truly I thought I was palsied for life. I tell thee, cuz, that thou art the strongest man that ever I laid my eyes upon. I take my vow, I felt my stomach quake when I beheld thee pluck up yon tree as thou didst. But tell me, how camest thou to leave Sir Edward and thy mother? Alas! answered young Gamwell, it is a snail story, uncle, that I have to tell thee. My father's steward, who came to us after old Giles Crookleg died, was ever a saucy varlet, and I know not why my father kept him, saving that he did oversee with great judgment. It used to gall me to hear him speak so boldly up to my father, who, thou knowest, was ever a patient man to those about him, and slow to anger at harsh words. Well, one day, and an ill day it was for that saucy fellow, he sought to berate my father I was standing by. I could stand it no longer, good uncle, so, stepping forth, I gave him a box o' the ear, and, wouldst thou believe it, the fellow straight away died o' it. I think they said I broke his neck, or something of the like, so off they packed me to seek thee and escape the law. I was on my way when thou sawest me, and here I am. Well, by the faith of my heart, quoth Robin Hood, for any one escaping the law, thou wast taking it the most easily that I ever beheld in all my life. Whenever did any one in the world see one who had slain a man, and was escaping because of it, tripping along the highway like a dainty court damsel, sniffing at a rose the while? Nay, uncle, answered Will Gamwell, over haste never churned good butter, as the say old saying hath it. Moreover, I do verily believe that this overstrength of my body hath taken the nimbleness out of my heels. Why, thou didst but just now wrap me thrice, and I thee never once shave by overbearing thee by my strength. Nay, quoth Robin, let us say no more on that score. I am right glad to see thee, Will, and thou wilt add great honour and credit to my band of merry fellows. But thou must change thy name, for warrants will be out presently against thee. So, because of thy gay clothes, thou shalt henceforth and for aye be called Will Scarlet. Will Scarlet, quoth Little John, stepping forward and reaching out his grave palm, which the other took. Will Scarlet, that name fitteth thee well. Right glad am I to welcome thee among us. I am Little John, and this is a new member who has just joined us, a stout tanner named Arthur Bland. Thou art like to achieve fame, Will, let me tell thee, for there are many a ballad sung about the country, and many a story told in Sherwood of how Robin Hood taught Little John and Arthur Bland the proper way to use a quarterstaff. Likewise, as it were, how our good master bit off so large a piece of cake that he choked upon it. Nay, good Little John, quoth Robin gently, for he liked ill to have such a jest told of him. Why should we speak of this little matter? Pree thee, let us keep this day's doing among ourselves. With all my heart, quoth Little John, but, good master, I thought thou that thou didst love a merry story, because thou hast so often made a jest about a certain increase of fatness on my joints, of flesh gathered by my abiding with the sheriff of— Nay, good Little John, said Robin hastily, I do bethink me that I have said full enough on that score. It is well, quoth Little John, for in truth I myself have tired of it somewhat. But now I bethink me, thou didst also seem minded to make a little jest of that rain that threatened last night, so... Nay then, said Robin testily, I was mistaken, I remember me now, that it did seem to threaten rain. Truly I didst think so myself, quoth Little John, therefore no doubt thou dost think of wit wise of me to abide all night at the Blue Boar Inn, instead of venturing forth in such stormy weather, dost thou not? A plague on thee and thy doings, cried Robin Hood, if thou wilt have it so, thou wert right to abide wherever thou didst choose. 
Once more it is well, quoth Little John, as of thyself. I have been blind this day. I did not see thee drubbed. I did not see thee tumbled heels overhead in the dust, and if any man says that thou wert, I would with clear conscience rattle his lying tongue between his teeth. Come, cried Robin, biting his nether lip, while the others could not forbear laughing. We will go no farther today, but we will return to Shorewood, and thou shalt go to Ancaster another time, little John. So said Robin, for now that his bones were sore, he felt as though a long journey would be an ill thing for him. So, turning their backs, they retraced their steps whence they came. Alas, the time I must away, but fear not, my dear friend, we shall return. I look forward to when we meet again to continue on our tale. <laughs>